Welcome to this week's episode of Inside the Headset presented by Coach Com. This week, we sit down with Jeff McMartin, the head coach of Central College. In this conversation, Coach McMartin discusses why he got into coaching, getting to serve as the head coach of his alma mater, and being selected as the president of the AFCA this past January. But first, a word from Coach Com. Deuce left, check with me. If they're in quarters match, we're going to Pittsburgh or Ohio. They're in zero, they're in zero. Let's go Hippo, Seattle, wide choice. If we call the protection right, it's six. When a play call is the difference between winning and losing, your headset choice could be your most important decision. When the call counts, CoachCom is the only choice for clear, dependable communication. Visit CoachCom.com for more info. We got it, guys. Good job. Now, let's get inside the headset with Coach McMartin. Coach McMartin, how you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me today. Oh, I'm excited about uh, diving in, man. Uh, our, our pre-podcast convo got me pretty excited about this podcast. Just a lot of a lot of little nuggets I think uh, coaches will be able to take away from this one. Well, good. I'm I'm looking forward to the opportunity to visit with you guys today, and, and uh, it's a real honor to be asked to be a part of this. And uh, I've always always enjoyed all of your podcasts that you guys put out, uh, and uh, something I look forward to listening to. So it's fun to be a part of this on on the other end of things. Awesome, coach. Well, let's let's go ahead and get rolling here with the first question we always ask: Is what was that point in time uh, that you knew you wanted to be a part of this great profession, and uh, how did you know? Well, I, you know, I think that going through my high school experience and, and college experience as a as a football player. Uh, you know, I've always loved the game. I'm the oldest of five kids. And, uh, you know, I think even as a, as a youngster, I grew up on a farm. My parents uh, are still farming to this day. And, uh, you know, we played all the sports at home. Uh, and I was always kind of, my dad was very busy on the farm and not, not overly, uh, uh, into athletics. Um, so growing up, so I kind of had to be the, the coach or the teacher to my younger brothers and they all played sports. In fact, all four of us played. Uh, college football and, and, um, you know, so I think early on, I kind of started, um, just seeing the importance of that or, or enjoying, you know, helping my brothers improve and myself, um, through, throughout our athletic careers. And then, you know, getting into high school, obviously, you know, you have some very influential coaches in your life. Uh, I not only had in high school, but in junior high. Um, and then going on to, uh, to college, I played for a great coach here and Ron Skipper, who was also a, uh, on the ASA Board of Trustees. He's a Hall of Fame coach, um, won a national championship. I mean, just he's it, it, very much a, a legendary coach, uh, you know, in Division Three, and, and here at, at Central and, and was Amos Alonzo Sag winner. I mean, he's kind of, he kind of did it all. I, I had a chance to play for him. And so I kind of got a, a firsthand view of the importance and power and of influence that coaches have. And, and that's really, you know, um, my, during my college years when I decided I really want to be a college football coach. Yeah. So what, what town are you from out there? Well, I, you know, my address in Iowa is uh, Grundy Center, um, Iowa. And then uh, I went to a high school named Wellsburg, which doesn't exist anymore. In fact, oh, wow. I had 28 kids in my class. So small, small uh, farming community, a small school. And like I say, it's not, it's not even a school anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's one of like five other schools, AGWSR. So it's, it's uh it's kind of you know in the mix with a whole bunch of places, but uh, uh, that's where I grew up, and and uh, you know I'm now I've lived in Pella, Iowa, you know Central College for the last twenty years. That's yeah. that's where where I went to school. Oh well, yeah, I was gonna say that, that it's unfortunate it doesn't exist anymore because you you talk about four four of you guys all went to play college football. That's amazing <laughs> when you got a kind of a family uh, lineage like that, and where all, all you go play ball. I imagine uh, you guys were pretty decorated at that high school. Well, I think they, each, each one of us got a little bit better, you know, and so where <laughs> I started, my brother improved and then yeah. it went on and on and on. And, um, you know, I've always kind of said that, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, and we have a sister who's the youngest of all, and obviously she didn't play football, but, uh, and she's an athlete in her own right. And, and, uh, and she's six foot one, so she's oh, wow. the tallest of us all. So they, like I say, everybody got better all the way through, <laughs> you know, they got, they got better looking, they got taller, they got more <laughs> athletic, you know. And you uh, But I guess my claim to fame maybe is I just, yeah, I helped them improve or Taught I kind of showed them how to catch a pass, you yeah, know. Yeah, there so. you go. Well, that's where the uh, that's where the coaching comes from. And, uh, sure. you know, I had the opportunity to play defensive back there at Central. Had an interesting yeah. playing career where you had two two injuries in two different years of your career that kind of 
uh, you know, put you on the sideline, put you away from the game a little bit, but you found a way to kind of uh, scratch that itch, I guess, because that the first injury, you spent some time at Oskaloosa High School. Um, and, and just talk about that experience there. I know it was only for a couple weeks during your injury, but why, why did you decide to go partake in that? Well, you know, it's kind of interesting how that all shook out. So I broke my arm like right away during two a days uh, in the preseason. And, you know, back in the 80s, they put a, a plaster cast on you. There's no fiberglass or anything like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you tried, I tried anyway. I, I taped a pillow to my cast and would go out and try and practice. And then you'd end up cracking the cast or breaking the cast. And plus you looked ridiculous, but, um, you know, at some point when the doctor put on the second or third cast, he's like, listen, you can't keep doing this. This is not, your, your, your arm's not going to heal. And, you know, we're, we're going through cast here and that's not what this is designed to do. And so, yeah. um, so we, and we'd actually had another guy on the team that had broken his arm as well. And he was actually student coaching. He was, he was kind of helping coach while he had his cast on at Central. And, uh, you know, back then, you know, now any, any more these days, people would be like, you know, I'll, uh, we'll take all the coaches we can get. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, back then it was more like, um, we've got a student coach, you know, what else are you going to do kind of thing. And, um, it turned out that, uh, um, Oskaloosa wasn't too far away. And there, the head coach at Oskaloosa was, um, uh, his son played on the team at Central. Okay. And he was also a legendary high school coach. His name is Jerry Staten. And uh, I had a chance to go over there and student coach while I have, was in a cast. And I knew once I got the cast off, their season would be about over and I could come back and rejoin uh, playing at that time. And uh, it was just a unique opportunity. And I decided to jump at it. And, and our coaching staff here at Central was really supportive of it. Uh, I think that they, you know, they wanted us to grow as, as men, just not as players. And so that's what I did. And then my the next year, kind of same thing happened. Uh, ended up breaking my arm again. And this time there was nobody else kind of helping student coach at Central, so I did. And, um, and it was a great opportunity. I got to go scout uh, games and, uh, help with recruiting and, um, you know, create, um, game scouting, scouting reports. And I just, at that point, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. Yeah. And uh, I grew a lot. I learned a lot. And so, you know, I oftentimes I'll share with this our own players or other people like, you know, when I broke my arm both of those times, and especially the second time, I mean, that was about as low point as you can get as an athlete. Yeah. And yet, uh, you know, God had a real plan for me, and uh, he, he kept me open-minded. Uh, I stayed open-minded uh, to what my opportunities were, and that kind of opened the door to coaching. And uh, it, it turned out to be a huge blessing. In fact, um, and I, it, it led to me getting a graduate assistantship. You know, had I not probably broken my arm, and coach for two years, right. my chances of becoming a graduate assistant would not have been as great. Yeah, I, I, I'm happy you kind of are segue into that. Before we talk about how you actually got the gig and all that kind of stuff, what um, you know, what did those two experiences do to help you when you did get there? Was it was there anything to help you prepare a little bit? I think you know, I know my first GA job, I had already coached high school ball, and I was still a little bit like in awe at how much how much ball there was that I wasn't even tapping into at the high school level. Um, you know, did it open your eyes to anything prior to you getting there? You know, I think just the opportunity to, to work with athletes, I think was an important thing, you know, to, to be on the other side of, you know, the other side of the, the coin a little bit, I guess right. to say without the, you know, seeing it from a coach's perspective, uh, understanding that there was a lot more that went into a practice or a game than just, you know, being on the field or, you know, in, or in, in lifting weights. I mean, there was a lot of preparation that was involved in it. And so I guess I went into my graduate assistantship knowing that there was going to be a lot of work involved and, and it wasn't just going to be on the field or game day. And I think that for some people that can be a very valuable lesson to learn is that, you know, it, you know, there are a lot of people that coaching looks like a, a great thing and it is. Um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like leadership. You know, there's a lot of work to it. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that people don't see on a daily basis that, um, you know, you have to be ready for and you have to accept if you want to be if you want to be good at it and you want to have some longevity to it. So yeah. I think that 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 taught me a lot. Uh, it also taught me the importance of just relating to and connecting with the players. You know, I, I think I went into my GA um, at Wake, you know, being able to at least connect with the guys on, on a on a coach player relationship as opposed to like a teammate relationship. And yeah. I think that that was maybe helpful for me. 
Yeah, well, I, I got I got two questions here for you. Uh, first and foremost, the the kind of the hardest thing in this profession, you know, although there there's hard, we can find that different ways, and there's a lot of hard parts about it. But one of the hardest thing is just kicking your foot through that first door, uh, getting that first opportunity that's kind of away from maybe your network. So, uh, how did you get that opportunity at Wake Forest? And then I do have to add this, just kind of getting to know you here as you're as you're talking about your small town farming community, you know. You're about to go a pretty long way uh, from home, <laughs> and oftentimes this this does scare a lot of guys away from their first position. It's too far, it's too different. You know, how did you prepare yourself for that? And also, once again, how did you get the job? All right, great question. Um, how I get the job, what I was prepared for, uh, it all kind of comes back to Central College. Yeah. Um, I really give Central you know, my undergraduate degree, uh, and then the people that I work with, the coaches and professors. Uh, in the exercise science department, uh, you know, I had a great coach and coach skipper. Uh, coach Bowser was another coach, uh, a longtime AFCA coach. He was actually the AFCA assistant coach of the year. Coach DeWard was also AFCA assistant coach of the year. So we actually have two guys that I also played for as assistant coaches that were the AFCA division three assistant coach of the year. So we had a great staff. Yeah. And those guys were really inspirational to me and, and motivated me and encouraged me along with, uh, our, our faculty, our professors. I had, and my advisor was Dr. Pam Richards, and she really encouraged me to become a college coach as well. And what Central did was they they helped me network and connect me. And so uh, at the time that I was in school, the office coordinator at Kansas State was a guy named is, is, was a guy named Del Miller, who uh, coached there for many many years with Coach Snyder. Uh, they really really built that program at Kansas State. Well, he was the office coordinator, and he was a Central grad. Now he he didn't know me from Adam, you know, but uh, he was great about. Uh, when they helped me make that connection, he was great about sharing with me how he got into coaching on the Division One level, yeah. how he got his graduate assistantship at the University of Iowa, you know, the whole process that he went through. He became a mentor to me. He kind of still is to this day. I, I stay in touch with him, and um, he's retired now, but uh, he's been super supportive of me throughout my whole career and, and a great mentor. Um, but Del Miller was somebody that I was like, I want to be like that guy. You know, I, I want to be the next Del Miller. And so – he really gave me a lot of information. One of the things he told me, he said he, he wrote over a hundred uh, cover letters. He sent out over a hundred cover letters and resumes. Um, and back then, you know, you, you know, there was no emails that didn't exist. There was no cell phones, none of it. It was all typing out the cover letter, you know, go to the print shop, make, print out your resumes. And, and I said, if he's done over a hundred, I'm going to do 10 more than he did. So I think I, I think my initial, inquiry was about 114 different schools where I sent out a cover letter and they saying, Hey coach, you know, I'm, I'm definitely Martin from central college. I'm a senior. I really want to work as a graduate assistantship. And, um, I hope that you'll, you know, look over my resume. And, and if, if you have an opening, you know, give me some, give me consideration. Um, and, uh, and then I started just calling people, networking, I, I went up and visited uh, North Dakota State. They didn't have an opening, but I went up there just to get my face in front of them and get to know them in case they did. I went down to Southern Illinois, kind of did the same thing. Um, and then I, those turned down letters just started rolling in, man. I, I, in fact, I, I'll tell you this. I have a, I saved them all. I, I don't know why I did it, but I saved them all and I put them in a book. And that this book is at least this thick, yeah. okay? And, um, and on the title of the book, I just wrote the word perseverance. And I, I still use this book. I show it to our own players now about their job search or things that they're trying to do in their life that they might seem hard or insurmountable or whatever. Um, but I didn't, you know, most, I didn't know anybody at any of these places other than, like I say, Coach Snyder, at, I mean, at Coach uh, at, at uh, Kansas State, so Del Miller. And, and so I was really kind of just putting it out there and, and trying my best to find find anything, find, find a job. And I tell you, it was a lot of work, a lot of prayer. Um, and as it turned out, uh, my coaches at Central kept encouraging me like, Hey, listen, you know, this is February, March, April, May, still hadn't heard anything. And, uh, they're like that, the, the graduate assistantship, those are some of the last positions the coaches fill. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Most of it's going to happen after spring ball. Um, and so, uh, literally I was tearing down my loft after I graduated from college and the phone rang to my room and it was a coach that wanted to interview me for a GA job. I mean, that, at, I, in fact, I remember walking across the stage, uh, giving my diploma thinking, I have nothing. I have no interviews. I have no jobs. I, I don't know what's going to happen to me next. Uh, but I'm going to keep trying. And, uh, you know, I, I, that was, it was like GA or bust. Like I was going to get a GA job. And, and, uh, 
Um, so I got that first interview, then I had another. And as it all shook out, I had seven different opportunities to, to coach as a GA that summer. And, uh, and it really ended up coming down to um, Utah State and Wake Forest and, and interviewed at Wake Forest. Um, and, uh, you know, the coaches that interviewed me shared with me, they said, part of the reason why you're even getting this interview is that you had coaching experience in your resume. Wow. Once again, it goes back to that broken arm, yeah. um, you know, and, and, uh, uh, if, if I had stayed healthy and had a four year football career, um, there's really a great, great likelihood. I would not have gotten a graduate assistantship at, at Wake. And so I was really fortunate. I worked for Bill Dooley, once again, a hall of fame coach. Uh, an outstanding person. He, we had a great staff. All of the guys on his staff were really loyal to Coach Dooley and he coached with him for a long time. And a lot of them had been with him at North Carolina and also at Virginia Tech. Most of them have come with him from Virginia Tech to, to Wake. And, 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 and Coach Dooley did some great things at Wake Forest. You know, that, that's, uh, um, you know, a job that, that, uh, you know, is a high academic and, and it's not a huge university. And so there's some real, you know, some great challenges. Uh, to succeeding there and uh, he did an awesome job and uh, was a great coach and I learned a lot from the entire staff and from Coach Dooley and I will forever uh, be you know in their debt that I had that opportunity to coach there you know you'd asked about like going away from the farm and a long way from home Um, you know once again I I think I give Central College a lot of credit for that and maybe my faith uh, probably those two things Um, you know my parents always instilled in me you know do what you love to do don't don't just take a job to have a job or to make money, but do something that you love. Um, I think Central College really taught me that, you know, you can get out on your own and you, you know, they gave me a lot of courage and confidence that I could do this. And, and, um, you know, and I wanted to coach and I was willing to go anywhere, any place to get started and have that opportunity. So, um, you know, and, and I'm glad I did. I remember I packed everything I owned into a little Dodge Omni and drove out to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, drove 19 hours and, uh, I just remember as I was driving down the interstate, just thinking to myself, man, this is the greatest thing that could ever happen to a person. You know, I couldn't yeah. wait to get started, and I, I loved every minute of it. That's awesome, Coach. Well, l- let me ask you two questions here about the way your way for a stop. Uh, first one is going to be um, well, the interview process, especially early on. Some some guys I've, I've had on the podcast can can be as decorated as you are as a coach and been a professional as long as you have and literally not ever interview. You know I don't know how many more you've had after this one, but uh, you know some some guys can just manage to just know a guy who knows a guy and always kind of just roll through the profession without it. And then there's some people that literally interview for every job that they, that they've had. You know, um, what, what what is there anything you remember from that from those phone calls? Uh, what was it physical? Obviously, there wasn't Zoom and all that kind of stuff at this point in time. But what was it, what was that interview process like for you? You know, just anything that stuck out. Yeah, it, it, it was it kind of was a two phone call interview. Um, I think that probably one of the things that I learned from that interview, and I kind of remembered always and and utilized. You know, I, I think a lot of times, you know, people look at things as being lucky. I think that, you know, preparation and hard work, that, that kind of creates luck if, yeah. if there is such a thing, you know. Um, and, you know, I'd, I'd had opportunity. I'd, I'd, I'd worked at it. I'd, I'd student coached. I'd, I'd tried to develop myself as a coach. And, and I'd say I, I really worked to find something, you know, through that process. But I think the thing that I learned the most through that, and, I, and it's something I carry with me, and I would suggest to anybody who's interviewing uh, for any job, is – I really hit upon the fact that I was there to serve them. I was there to make their program as good as it could be. Yes, it was going to benefit me by getting my master's or getting my foot in the door or coaching in the division one level, but I didn't, I didn't focus on that. I focused on how I could help them become a better team and what I would be willing to do for them from a work standpoint or from a commitment or loyalty standpoint. And I think that a lot of times uh, when I get resumes from other coaches uh, or if I talk to other coaches that are looking for jobs, you know, they, they'll oftentimes make a point of like how that job is going to really help them. Yeah. And not that it shouldn't, right. but I think that the thing that everybody needs to remember is, is that when you're interviewing or when you're applying for a job, it's your job to help that employer understand how you're going to benefit their program, their organization, how you're going to become um, an, uh, an asset to them. Right. Um, you know, they're, that's really what they're looking for. That's really what they need. You know, they, they, they don't need a guy who just wants to move closer to home or they don't need a guy who, you know, really wants to be a coordinator because that's just the next step in his progression. They need a guy who's going to make their program better, you know, serve their program. And, and I think I made it a point to convince 
Wake Forest of that, uh, that with my background, I would, I understood the work that was involved and I was willing to do that work and I wanted to serve them. And that was really all I wanted out of the equation. I wasn't doing this to, you know, to rise to the ranks or anything like that, even though those things will happen eventually yeah. that wasn't my motivation for wanting to be a, a graduate assistant coach or an annual level. yeah and and so the second part of that question and I appreciate you sharing that by the way um the second part of that question is you kind of got out your comfort zone a little bit uh defensive back guy um uh, you, you end up playing a little bit more in the front or uh, coaching a little bit more in the front seven there uh, mm-hmm. why was it good for you especially early on in your career to maybe get outside of your comfort zone from a uh, co- coaching standpoint yeah, I think that the whole theme of Wake Forest was you're out of your comfort zone. You know, you're 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 in ACC, you're in the South, you're Division One, you're a long way from away from home. And and I, I went in thinking I was going to help with the defensive backs. And then as I got there, uh, another coach uh, had joined the staff as a volunteer coach and really wanted to work with the defensive backs. And so they asked me to move the linebackers. I was like, great, uh, it's a different opportunity. I'll I'll get a chance to learn a new position. And then my second year, I got a chance to work with the defensive line, which I also was really excited about because now I had two positions under my belt that I'd worked with. And I felt that that would make me more marketable as once I graduated from being a defensive, uh, from being a graduate assistant. Yeah. Uh, when I started to look for a job that I'd have a lot more opportunities to say, Hey, I've coached that position. I've worked with that area. I've worked on the back end of defense. I worked on the front end. And uh, so I, I saw it as a great opportunity. Yeah. There's more learning involved, but, um, you know, that's kind of been my whole career. I've, I've taken a lot of opportunities and I've, I've worked at a lot of different uh, jobs where I, I didn't coach a position that I necessarily played. In fact, after I graduated from Central, I never, I've never coached defensive back since. Right. And so I've, I've coached a lot of other positions, but I've never been a DB coach. And, uh, and so, but it's been good for me. I've, I've learned so much. I've grown so much. Um, I would tell anybody that if they have that opportunity, I think it's a great thing because you end up really having to to learn and get feedback from your athletes and from other coaches um, because you can't just fall back on, well, these are the drills that I did when I played or this is what we did when I was a player. And I'm not saying that that's bad. I mean, there's probably a lot of good drills and a lot of good things you learn as a player. Correct. But for me, I felt like it was really beneficial uh, looking back that I had to go learn some things and, and I had to get out of my comfort zone a little bit. Um, because I think as players and as coaches, like we're, we're always a little bit out of our comfort zone and we ask our players to get out of that comfort zone at times. And if I couldn't do it myself, how could I ask others to do it? No doubt. And now a quick word from Hater Athletic. Since 1954, Hader Athletic has been your trusted partner in football practice equipment. Handmade in the USA with care and dedication, our products are crafted to elevate your team's performance. But what truly sets us apart? It's our unwavering commitment to customer service. When you reach out, you'll be speaking to a real person with extensive product knowledge that prioritizes you getting your equipment fast. Experience the Hader difference today. Visit HaderAthletic.com and join the community of coaches who trust us for quality, reliability, and expertise. Hader Athletic. Four coaches, by coaches. Save 15% on your next order by using promo code AFCA2024 at checkout. Now, let's get back to the episode. I'll tell you one of the things, you know, before we kind of move on to your next stop here is that I enjoy is oftentimes I'm looking, especially at head coaches that have a lot of years of experience, I can kind of look and say, oh, you know, Coach McMartin, he's a, he's a, he's a DB guy. You know, he's a receiver guy. <laughs> it's like, I mean, <laughs> you've been a little bit of everything. You know, prior to being a head coach, which is which is awesome, because I'm sure, and I will ask you this here, you know, I'm sure that helped you when it was all said and done. You know, be a better head coach when you had all these experiences on both sides of the ball. But in, anywho, all right, you spend your, uh, you you get that opportunity to coach both uh, linebackers and D line there at, at Wake Forest, and then in '92 uh, you get your first opportunity to be, you know, ha- have have your own room, be a full time coach, and uh, you know, uh, it's at a Division three spot at Illinois Wesleyan. So it's also very unique. I think those jobs are super rewarding because you get to do so much other stuff, you know, whether you want to or not. You end up with a lot of uh, wearing a lot of hats there. And so uh, just talk to us a little bit about some of those hats. But before you do that, um, how did how did this job arise? How did you get connected? And what made you say yeah to it? OK, so once again, uh, I think it was um, preparation and opportunity, you know, that kind of colliding a little bit. But, uh, you know, after I, my, after my second year as a graduate assistant back in 1990, 91, 92, when I was a GA, um, 
you you only could be a GA for two years and then you had to leave, whether you wanted to leave or not. Soon after I graduated, they extended it to three years. Um, uh, but back then you had two years and you were you were on to the next thing. So I knew that my two years were up. I went to spring ball my second year. I knew I had to find another job. And so you just can you start applying for other graduate assistantships or, um, you know, football, I mean, anything, football ops and whatever, whatever was out there, you kind of start looking to see if you'd be a good fit for that, as well as uh, coaching at other levels. And I'd already played Division three, so I kind of knew what that was about. Yeah. And so there was an opportunity to uh, become the defensive line coach and hall director at Illinois Wesleyan. And that job came up uh, kind of early summer. Uh, after my graduate assistantship was over after I got my master's. And, and so I applied for it. And I think that the fact that I had had a background in Division three and and people had known about our program at Central and the success that it's had, um, that probably moved my resume up a little bit. Um, and the fact that I coached the defensive line and I was willing to live in a dorm, uh, you know, and as it turned out, it was an all-male freshman dorm, about 121 uh energetic young freshman trying to figure out life. And, uh, so, uh, so there was, you know, and, and the pay was not great. Um, and, uh, it did, it didn't need to be, it was an entry level job. Uh, and I also could live on campus for free and eat on campus for free. So there were some real benefits to that. Now, along with that, I was married. And so it wasn't just me making a decision. I had to convince my wife, my young, I'd been married for about a year. We got married halfway through my GA at Wake. I had to convince my wife that she wanted to live in a male freshman dorm too. And so that was part of this equation as well. That was not just a decision Jeff and Martin made, but it was a decision Jeff and his wife made. And, and, yeah. uh, um, as it turned out, it was, it was awesome. You know, I, I, uh, like I said, I didn't get paid a ton of money, but I got to coach my own position, uh, worked with a really good staff and coach Ash and coach Murray was our defense coordinator who's now the head coach at Elmhurst college. And I learned a lot from those guys and, and, and uh, we had a really, really good team. Our first, my first year there, we, we made the playoffs, uh, and, uh, had an exciting run. Um, and also, uh, learned a lot as a hall director, working, working with student life and just working with the kids. You know, I, uh, um, you know, we all go through as coaches, like when we're in season like that, we're in the moment, you know, that, that practice is the most important thing we're doing that day. And, and, uh, that, you know, that game plan for that week, that's the most important thing that we're doing. And it should be. Um, the thing that I, that I think kind of grew me a little bit there and maybe I got out of it that I didn't think I was going to get out of it in a good way was after that was all done, when that practice got over and we were done with our staff meetings, I went back to the dorm with those guys and they had life, you know, they had to figure out life. And, uh, so I really tuned in to the fact that, you know, it's not just about how good somebody can block or get off of a block or tackle or catch a pass. But you really need to connect with these young men if you're going to help grow them and if you're going to help them become the best people that they can be, the best students they can be. You know, they have a lot of other things going on in their day outside of just that two hour practice. And, and if you can reach them, if you can connect them, if you can kind of have empathy for that, um, you can really build a great connection with your players. And it's a, and, and, and it's a good, healthy coach player relationship connection. I think that that's critical, but. Uh, I, I learned a lot. You know, sometimes if a guy has a bad practice, not just because he's not focused or he's not, he doesn't care. He might have something going on at home or he might have something going on academically that he just taken with him to the field. And I, I gained a greater understanding of that and learned how important that was by being a hall director and living with these guys, yeah. you know, 24 hours a day. Yeah, seeing, um, seeing them in such a different light than, than the practice field, yeah. for sure. Uh, I, yeah. I, I, you mentioned something. I definitely want to tap on it. Just, just uh any anytime someone talks about getting married during the profession, like right, especially early on when you're not not making much money and every right. job, I mean, it's just an opportunity. You're kind of willing to take it, but you say you marry your you marry your wife in your second year as, as a GA. So this is ninety one, and yeah. so let's just say from ninety one to two thousand one. Let's put ten years on it. You went from North Carolina to West, Illinois <laughs> to New York to Wisconsin and to Indiana. Um, I. Once again, this is for coaches, and this is something we all deal with. You know, we all have to have these uh, sometimes tough, sometimes not conversations with our significant others and, and our kids and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I, I, I especially mean, you know, getting married early on in a certain situation, how do you prepare them? How did you talk to your wife about all these stops that I guess at the time you didn't know were going to happen, but as they kind of popped up? Yeah. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Um, you know, I've, I've, I, once again, feel really blessed 
you know, uh, I've had so many good people in my life and probably the most important of all of them uh, has been my wife. Yeah. And uh, we actually met each other in kindergarten. We did not start dating then, but we, we known each other. So we were two of 28 kids in the same class now. And so we, you know, we got to go back for class reunions now because if we don't, then nobody will show up. But uh, so I've known her since kindergarten and uh, we, we started dating in high school. And then our, our relationship really grew in, in college. And, uh, you know, early on, like you know, we'd be in, in, in our room or something in, in college and we'd be watching football and be like, man, this girl likes watching football like that. She's a keeper, you know, like I'm, you know, she's, she's all in on this stuff. And I think that that, you know, that was something I kind of knew early on that this was, she was probably going to be a really good person uh, to be with and, and to marry and to have in my life. And I feel really blessed that God brought her to me and to us to have this relationship. And so it's been a blessing, but she's, you know, I think that we did a good job of communicating on the front end, what this yeah. was going to kind of look like. And, and I think that that's really important. You know, I, I would share that with all, uh, coaches that are thinking about getting married or, you know, ha ha you know having a family and, and kind of going through this, this career um, is just, you know, really communicate on the front end and make sure everybody understands and, and really get to know this person that you're, you're going to marry, you know, what, you know, what their values are and what, you know, learn a lot about their character because your values and, and uh, who you are as a person uh, both you and your, your, your wife. I mean, those things are going to be, those things are going to be tested throughout your whole career. And, yeah. and, uh, you know, if you find someone that, you know, if you see it as a, as a team, as a partnership and that you're not just doing this by yourself and that they feel connected to that as well, I think that that's a, that's a great thing. Um, because then, yeah, then they'll help you pack the, the moving truck, <laughs> you know, every other year or yeah. whatever it is. And that's they'll right. live in a, they'll live in a freshman dorm with you. Um, you know, well, all of their other friends from college are buying houses and, you know, driving new cars and, and, and you're not. Right. And, uh, and I think that that, you know, we've been married for 32 years now. And I, I tell everybody, you know, I think one of the, probably one of the greatest things I've done in coaching is I've kept my wife out of the transfer portal. You know, I mean, she, <laughs> yeah, right. she's been tremendously loyal and she's hung with me this whole time. And, um, I'm very thankful for that, but. You know, I think it was a lot of it was like, we, we talked about this a lot on the front end. You know, we, we, she knew going in, it wasn't something, uh, that, uh, and she knew it wasn't going to be glamorous, you know, and it wasn't, we weren't going to make a, a, a ton of money right away. And, um, and that's not why we got into this, right. you know, and so it's, we've been a team ever since. Hey Amen. Well, I appreciate you sharing that coach. It's, it's kind of a tale of two, two careers that you have. Cause I, at least has been a lot more stable, like the past t two decades, but that first one was pretty yeah. crazy. A lot of, a lot of moving, a lot of shaking there. Um, a lot of moving. yeah. So you have that opportunity at Illinois Wesleyan. Um, and then you end up at, at, at university of Rochester, New York. Um, obviously you're back at the defensive line position again. So I want to tap into this other thing that seems like you got a genuine interest in, been this track coach uh so you kind of got a spring job where you're, where you're coaching these athletes and that's you, you know um I'm, I'm sure there's some crossover obviously there is i mean you, you want speed on the football field but it is a whole different sport i mean uh how did you take the time to make sure that you were a proficient track coach and how did you take the time to maybe get out your comfort zone because I'm, I'm assuming you probably ran track in high school and all that good stuff and Maybe you didn't hurdle, so you have to go learn how to hurdle. Maybe you didn't triple jump. Maybe you got to learn to triple jump. So uh, talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, once again, I mean, it's, it's kind of almost a theme maybe of my career is I, I did get out of my comfort zone. When I was the only Wesleyan, uh, once again, I, I didn't make a ton of money as a hall director. I wasn't making a ton of money as a football coach. And they said they'd give me another 1000 bucks a year if I helped coach track. And I was like, that sounds like a lot of money to me. And I signed up for it. Yeah. And I'd never coached track before in my life. In fact, I didn't do college track. My wife ran college track, but I did okay. not. And um, so, and and they wanted me to coach the throwers. So I couldn't even ask my wife, like, well, how am I going to make these guys faster? You know, it was like, you're the throws coach. And so, fortunately, at Illinois Wesleyan, uh, Illinois State University is a normal. Bloomington and normal are two adjoined towns. I mean, it's literally like eight, ten blocks away yeah. from our campus. So I would go over to Illinois State and talk to their throws coaches about what to do, drills. And then we'd go out and practice, and I'd kind of get feedback from our athletes. We had some really good senior throwers. I'd say, okay, you know, you like that? How'd that work? You know, are we seeing improvement? And you can chart, the, you know, one of the nice things, too, with track is it's, it's there's measurable, you know, like every meet, if you're getting better, if you're seeing improvement, you're, that can kind of indicate, hey, 
we are, you know, this is working, you know, what we're teaching them or coaching them or how they're, how they're practicing. And so, you know, we had that and, and I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I did do track in high school and, and, um, and like I say, my wife is a track athlete and, and, uh, was certainly open to, you know, just becoming a, you know, we didn't have spring ball back then in division three, there was no spring practice. So I had my spring available, uh, to, to do this outside of recruiting. And, uh, so I was able to, to really gain that experience and had a great experience. I, in fact, my second year, our track coach left and they made me the interim head track coach. So for one season at Illinois Western, I was the interim head track coach. Got to be a head coach for a little bit. Then I went to Illinois, I went to the University of Rochester and I worked for a legendary uh, track coach there named Tim Hale. And he was awesome. Uh, I learned so much about just coaching yeah. and connecting with players, technique. I mean, uh, he, it, he was a, a great mentor to me as well. And so I was getting, I was, I was getting a lot of experiences as a coach. Yeah, even if it wasn't football, that I think made me a better football coach. Um, once again, just having that mindset of like, I'm going to learn it. I'm going to seek feedback. I'm going to continue to keep improving, keep growing, um, you know, and, and, and never, you know, never be satisfied. Yeah. I think that those things were really reinforced for me as, as, a, as a track coach as well as a football coach early in my career. Yeah. Well, you said, you said something twice has been super interesting to me, especially as a, the director of education here at the AFCA, you know, I'm always all about finding ways to sharpen those tools. And, and, uh, you know, obviously it's a little bit easier in, in, in this day and age to hop on YouTube and, you know, maybe find some drills for, for a thrower or, you know, just scroll through Twitter and you might run it, bump into something. But, you know, in, in, at this point in time and, you know, early nineties, mid nineties, you know, yeah, the internet was around, but it wasn't that accessible and all that kind of stuff. But you decided to go a couple blocks down and go talk to this, to this coach and then earlier in your career as a player I, I, I don't let me mess the name up here but Dale Miller at Kansas State you know you, you're reaching out and you're having these di- this dialogue with him and I sometimes see some coaches they they do miss on that they do miss on the opportunity to just go sit down face to face with somebody and realize that these guys are accessible and willing to, to pour into you and help you out if you if you if you are willing to ask the question and so how how did you recognize that was something that was important you know just to develop as a coach yeah well, you know, it, it is true. You, you know, I, I think, uh, going to clinics and I think that, you know, there's so much information, um, on the internet right now online and, and they're really valuable tools. Like you can grow and you can learn a lot uh, just by what, what's out there. I mean, the AFCA obviously does an amazing job of that, um, through, through their library. But I think that there is still a huge value in being, being there in person. You know, uh, in the same room, you're able to bounce ideas, ask questions. Um, you also are developing relationships. And we are in the you know, coaching is it's the people business, man. You know, people are the purpose of yeah. what we do every day. And I think that getting getting there face to face, having a conversation, developing a relationship. I mean, we still as a staff, we try and get to a, you know, to a different school to meet with a different staff every year. Uh, it, sure, it'd be easy just get online and, and, uh, watch it, watch, watch a video. And we do that, yeah. but I think there's still a huge value in getting around people, um, other coaches, um, getting to know them, asking them questions. If you can watch them practice or, you know, that was another thing. I, I, I could go watch Illinois state do workouts and see the drills the throwers did. Yeah. You know, if you can get to a place uh, in football and go watch spring ball and they, they can talk to you about a drill they want to do, and then you can watch them do it. I think that those are huge things. You know, you learn so much by, being present and being in the moment. Um, and then, you know, I think the, maybe the plus side of it all is you continue to build relationships and, and connections with other coaches. Hey Amen. Well, uh, it sounds like great, great career, uh, great start to your career, both as a defense line coach and as a track coach. But then you get an, another change there here in, uh, 95. Um, you, you take a new job and, and, and you have, <laughs> and I said this to you beforehand. Probably the most interesting combination of of jobs I've ever seen. You're the head track coach. Uh, yeah. You're the offensive line coach, where these guys don't run very far, very fast. And then, uh, and, and then you're also responsible for the kickers, snappers, and holders on the special teams. Uh, so, I mean, in, in all honesty, from a from a uh, I don't know, just from a load standpoint, I mean, it just sounds like a sounds like a, a big change for you and a, a lot that you're trying to carry because I'm. I'm assuming once again you probably have to figure out how, you know, the deep snap, te- uh, long snapping techniques, and you know, the the ins and outs of being a great holder, and you know, where exactly should a kicker strike the ball with? 
these offensive line techniques and then once again just being responsible for a whole track program. So what was what was that 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 opportunity like for you? I it was awesome. I was I feel really blessed. Uh, I'm I worked with some great coaches, Coach DeGeorge and, and um at at, at Boyd College and, and his son Dave DeGeorge. He and I are like best friends and we both were on the coaching staff as assistants together and um you know having a chance to be on the offensive side of the ball after being on the defensive side of the ball. And, 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 uh, we, back then we, we actually ran the wing tee, uh, and that was a, because, and that's the only time I've ever run the wing tee in my life, but it, um, at that school with our, our size of our squad and, and the people we're competing with, it was kind of like running the option. Like we were different, yeah. you know, and I, and I, I learned that, you know, sometimes in some situations you, you go to a place that maybe it, it might be hard to win or you might, you might not be the favorite or you might not have the most guys on the team. Like if you can, if you can tap into maybe something you do that people have to prepare yeah. special for, like they got to, it's not just what everybody else is doing. Yeah. Uh, I think that can give you a huge advantage. And for us, I mean, I, I had a front row seat for seven years as the offensive line coach of us beating teams that we had no business winning. And I give coach to George a lot of credit. He's a great head coach. He did a great job of motivating our guys. And, and he, he, you know, he was very much a, a special guy. And I think if you look at the records there and who's done what, um, he stands out I and mean, he's legendary, uh, at that school. And, uh, um, and like I say, just learning how to do that, you know, once again, coaching the offensive line for the first time and then coaching the wing tee for the first time. I mean, it was just, you were always like learning from other people. You were having to make phone calls and go visit other coaches and, and anything you could read, you'd read. And, and then same thing as a head coach. I, the, the, the late job was a great job because I got to be a head coach for the first time and I got to make decisions. I got to hire staff. I had to set, standards and, and rules for the team, how we we're going to train and travel, manage a budget, uh, recruit, you know, my recruiting calls at night, back then, once again, there were no texting or emails, you know, it was like, call a football player, call a track ass. I mean, I just go every other one. I mean, I literally did. And every time I was on one phone call, I felt like I was, you know, should have been calling the other guy, you know, so I, I was probably, that was probably the only downside of the game. For five years, I felt guilty in recruiting because I was always like, I should be calling the other guy, you know, but. Uh, I, I ultimately get to both of them, but, uh, you know, I, I really felt like it was a good, great experience. Um, you know, I, I also had a chance to coach the women's, I was head, women, men's and women's, so coach the women's sport. That was really important. I was also in charge of recruiting and managing the cross country programs. I, I didn't actually coach cross country because it was in the fall, but I was the administrator for that. So, uh, our coaches in cross country were part time. So I had to recruit all the cross country kids and, um, you know, so it was, you were, I never, wanted for things to do i was always busy uh, but it was really good i i loved what i was doing you know yeah. it wasn't work i was i was coaching and recruiting and those are the two things that i really enjoyed and i felt called to do and, and yeah. so i was where i needed to be and um and i learned a lot i grew a lot you know being a head coach helped me so much working for coach george on on, uh, on football and on offense helped me a ton and it was just an, it was a great five years yeah uh, let me ask you this question. What was rewarding for you uh, you know, in, in the long run, taking that whiteboard and flipping it over for the first time and just kind of been on that other side of the ball? Like what what gave you an edge just been such a, you know, I, I guess at that point you've been 100% defense at that, you know, as both as a player and coach. Um, what advantages did you have? And then what was rewarding in the future, you know, kind of having both perspectives? Yeah, and this is another thing I think that young coaches or all coaches, you know, um, you know, t- should think about having coached on the defense. When I became an offensive coach, I knew what the defensive linemen did not like. You know, I knew what worked against them. I knew, you know, what was going to work in a blocking situation and maybe what wasn't going to, you know, uh, be successful. Um, same thing in the running game and, and, and just in how we strategize when we would game plan. Um, you know, having coached on defense, it, and on the front end and the back end of things, you know, I, I knew things that gave defenses trouble. And so we could sit in staff and say, well, you know, this is something that's going to give them trouble because it always gave us trouble when I coached that or whatever. And, yeah. and I think that that's a good thing. And I've used that the rest of my career. I mean, I can go into our offensive staff meeting now and say, hey, fellas, you know, as you're developing this game plan and just kind of watching this, like this is something they're going to try and take away from you. This is, this is going to be their mindset a little bit. And then you, I go into the defensive room and I can tell our defensive staff, like, you know, cover up that spot receiver. I mean, they're just going to attack it all day long. You know, like you got to think about some of these things because yeah. that's how an offense is going to think. You know, you, you got to 
you got a great front here, you got a great scene, but if you don't take away some of these things, that's exactly where they're going to go with it. And I, and I think that that for me was probably the most important thing of getting able to coach offense was that I, I now could see it through both lenses and, and have both, both experiences on both sides of the ball. It was, it was invaluable for me. Yeah. Okay. So let's, uh, let's, let's kind of move forward here. Uh, in 2000, you, you, I mean, honestly, probably one of the more unique podcasts I've done because you ha- you have led some rooms at this point in time. You, had, you, you know, this is not your first time leading a big unit like this because you, you ran a, a track program and, you know, led a men's team and women's team and all this kind of stuff. But this is the first time, um, you know, you're not, you hadn't been on offense, I guess. I, well, I guess you had you were offensive line coach for five years. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you're a relatively new offensive coach, I guess. <laughs> Still a ball coach, but a relatively new offensive coach. Um, you do have this experience leading a room before. What were let me ask this question first. Uh, what was maybe some of the difficulties of, of of just adapting and adjusting to being a first time offensive coordinator? That's a little bit easier to say now as you as, as you're far away from it. Sometimes people don't want to admit the struggles, but we all have you know the, that first time doing anything is always a little difficult. What were some of the ones that you kind of recall? Well, when I moved to DePaul from Beloit, that was that was the reason why I left Beloit was the chance to be an offensive coordinator. Yeah. And interestingly enough, like Beloit, uh, you know, we were a wing tee team. DePaul did not want to and did not run the wing tee. That was not their thing. Uh, Coach Morozik was a West Coast offense guy. and He really wanted someone that could come in and, and run his offense. And so I think part of what gave me an opportunity to coach there and work with Coach Morozik at DePaul was the fact that I was willing to coach his system. I wasn't bringing in my own offense. He wanted he, – he knew what he wanted. He's the smartest football coach I've ever worked for, an amazing mind. Um, he knew what he wanted, and I was going to be the guy that could coordinate it and execute it. And I think sometimes, too, that's a that's an important thing. You know, when you're a coordinator, you got to think about that word a little bit. Like, you're coordinating things. Yeah. You're you're bringing everybody in to the table. You're you're planning the practices. You're you're creating the vision. But ultimately, you're still you're still really there to work and to serve the head coach and our head coach wanted to run the the the, the uh, West Coast. And I was willing to learn it and work at it, and and uh, you know, so it it uh, it all timed out really well. And then um, as we went through that first year, um, you know, there were some some things with our our uh, our, our players, you know, kind of the uh, what they were doing as far as their skill set that really kind of pushed us a little bit out of that. We we kind of evolved even in that first year out of the West Coast into more of a spread offense. And we we were very multiple. We we did both of those things. But but with the with the spread stuff and that was just kind of coming out at that time. Yeah. It's kind of becoming much more common. Um you know, we we had an opportunity uh to kind of grow uh into that a little bit because of you know our maybe lack of depth at some positions and our the amount of depth we had at other positions. It just got our best people on the field. And so even though I, I really got hired to run the West Coast, we, we kind of evolved that first year. And it wasn't anything I was trying to do against, you know, yeah. what our head coach wanted or anything. It just kind of it kind of evolved that way based on our personnel. And then for the last four years, we were we ran less and less West Coast and more and more spread all the time. Yeah. Um, I, I also was really blessed. I worked with Matt Walker, who's the head football coach at UW River Falls now. And Matt's a, a great offensive mind as well. And. Uh, I learned a ton from him, and, and he had played quarterback at DePaul, so he had a really good knowledge of the passing game. And so I learned a lot from our coaching staff, uh, the other assistants, as much as I did from our head coach. So I felt really blessed in that area as well. Yeah, well, that's uh, that kind of brings back some memories during my career. I had the opportunity to work for two offensive coordinators, where we we pretty much we had a system, we ran it, we didn't we didn't really divvy off of it too much, maybe a wrinkle here or there, and then we. You know, uh, actually with Todd Barry, our uh, our former executive director, you know, we were very, very flexible throughout our time. And we would find ourselves sitting in staff meetings. And that was probably probably my favorite thing. One of the things I miss most about the profession was we'd sit down and be like, all right, guys, what can we do? You know, and, and we're just sitting up on the board, we're throwing out ideas and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I just remember, you know, we're I remember calling Dino Babers. He was at Bowling Green. They were doing some pretty cool stuff. And. You know, all the line coaches calling somebody else that he's seeing doing some pretty cool stuff. What when y'all were kind of going into this a little bit more of a spread deal? Like, you know, you've been a guy that was definitely not afraid to call somebody and walk across the street and ask some questions. You know, what were y'all dipping into to kind of maybe get some knowledge to, especially as the spread been been very new at that point in time? Yeah, I mean, 
DePaul, I couldn't have worked, walked into a better situation from a guy who was always trying to learn from other people or, yeah. um, you know, coach, coach, uh, Morosis, uh, at DePaul, they had graduate assistant coaches there. And a lot of his graduate assistants had gone on and become head coaches or assistants at other places, division one on down. He's had a number of former players that are even scouts in the NFL. And one is the general manager at, uh, for the New York Giants, Joe Shane played wide receiver for us at, at DePaul. So, I mean, he, Coach Coach Morosis and the DePaul football legacy is is uh, really really special. That uh, there are a lot of tigers out there, and uh, they they're doing some amazing things in the coaching profession. NFL coaches, Division One, all the way down in you know, Division Two, II, Division Three, um, and so because that tree was so big, um, you know, we could call guys. You know, um, at like we had there were coaches at Northwestern, and, and at that time Randy Walker was the head coach there, and they were running the spread, and and uh, we had a, a former player who was a GA at, at uh, Grand Valley State. Uh, our starting center was a GA at Grand Valley State, and they were running the spread, and they were running no huddle, and they were going fast. And uh, when Coach Kelly was there, who's now at LSU, um, and so we could get ideas from those guys. I mean, we there wasn't a. I mean, it just seemed like we we had just an open open book to coaches uh, throughout the country that we could get information from and learn from and grow from. And so, you know, it not only was what we were talking about in our office, but we had access to, to, uh, be able to, Matt McPherson still at Northwestern and uh, he had been a former player. In fact, Matt worked at the park for two days and then he left for Northwestern when I got the job. So I was on, we were on each other's staff for two whole days. And, uh, but, you know, he was a guy that, you know, we could tap into and connect with. Yeah. And, um, and, and that, that has continued to this day, but I mean, uh, I feel really fortunate that that Coach Morosas had grown a tree, a really, really big coaching tree uh, that we had access to, you know, so many different people, so many different places that we could ask questions to and get information from. Yeah, that's awesome, Coach. Well, 2004 is a uh, special year. I think anybody uh, that's in this great profession would relish the opportunity to come back to their alma mater, you know, at least for a little bit. Um, what a special opportunity and not just be there as a position coach, but to come back as the head coach. Um, well, what was exciting about that opportunity for you? How did that go down? And then we'll tap into um, to your career there a little bit. Well, once again, you know, I really feel uh, blessed. And I feel like, you know, um, we had, I was the office coordinator, recruiting coordinator at the time at DePaul. And that year, at the end of the season, Coach Morosis, and, and he had actually told us ahead of time, but he retired. And that's a scary thing, you know, when you have a, a your head coach is going to retire and what's going to happen with the staff and everything. And, and, uh, so, uh, you know, my feeling was until, until I know if I'm going to be retained or not, I'm going to continue to work hard and continue to recruit. I'm going to leave this place in a better place than what I found it, uh, from the standpoint of our, our team and recruiting and everything. And so I, I just kept working until they told me I wasn't going to work anymore. And while I was on the road recruiting that, that, uh, winter, I got called by the athletic director at Central College and there was going to, there had been a coaching change there, uh, um, and they were looking for a head coach and wanted to know if I would want to interview for it. And, uh, of course I did. And, um, and I was fortunate enough to get the position. Um, and, and so, um, and, and it kind of the same thing that happened with me and Matt McPherson, Bill Lynch got the head job at DePaul two days before I got the job at Central. So I worked on Bill Lynch's staff at DePaul for two days and, and he hadn't, I'd communicated with him and I'd interviewed and everything, but, uh, yeah, I got to coach with him for two whole days. And then I said, well, I'm actually going to you know, take this job and, and move forward uh, with my wife. We had a two-year-old and we were eight months pregnant with our second daughter at the time. But uh, she had been alone. So it was a, a lot easier move to make to convince her to move at that, that point. Yeah. Um, but we, we loved the Paul. We, we missed we missed it uh, when we had to leave. But uh, um, but I remember the last day, you know, just setting that stack of recruits on their desk and just everything was ready to go and they could kind of keep moving forward with that and I was I was glad that I was able to kind of leave it in a good place and and um and and leave on good terms I think that was a really important thing too that you know you you uh you know people change jobs it's part of the part of the business but right. you can leave on good terms that's a I think a really that's nice if that can happen for yeah. you and I was able to do that there Amen. um and then yeah uh started off as a as a First time head coach at my alma mater. Man, well, what a, what an opportunity, and honestly, what what a opportunity has kind of continued to be for you. 
Um, you, you took the job in 2004. We're sitting here in 2024. So 20 years later, uh, you, I mean, you just said it, not really in regards to this, to, to this, what I'm about to say, but you changed jobs in this profession. I mean, to, to, to be somewhere five years kind of in this profession right now is pretty long. Um, to be, be somewhere for 20 years is absolutely amazing. So um, 2024, Coach McMartin, talking to the 20, 2004 Coach McMartin, what, what would you say to him? What piece of advice would you give to that young uh, <laughs> Coach McMartin that is uh, now is responsible for a full program? You know, I think that uh, early on, you know, obviously when you coach at your alma mater, and I think when you coach anywhere, everyone takes pride in their work yeah. and they want to do well. And certainly I want to see Central continue to be strong and grow and, you know, be a great program. And so um, obviously there was, it was, a, it was a great opportunity, but I think there was a lot of I, I, maybe internal pressure, you know, that you put on yourself to, to do a great job. And so I think if I were talking to Coach Martin in 2004 right now, I'd just say, you know what, um, just, you know, work hard, um, you know, execute, execute your plan, um, get, surround yourself with good people. And and um, and then and then let things happen the way they're supposed to happen. Try try not to worry about it. You know, put put a put faith in in your abilities. Put faith in your staff and the players. Uh, do the best you can. Um, pray a lot. Uh, and uh, and and try not to to worry too much. You know, I think yeah. that I would probably tell that coach that that bit of advice. And I I think it's really it really comes down to you know, and I I tell this to our players all the time. I two daughters now and they both run track and field, you know, um, and we talk about this all the time. It's a mindset thing. You know, ask yourself, what does the situation demand? Um, what are my abilities? And then execute based on those two things. You know, yeah. what is what is it going to take for us to be successful in football? What are we going to need? And then what can we do? What Where, where are we at with things? And then, and then go on and execute based on those two things. Know what you need, know what you're, know what you're able to do, and then go out there and execute. And I think that if you keep that kind of mindset, I think that that kind of keeps you not so looking, you know, too far ahead or too far behind. Yeah. And, and I think it's a really important thing to be in the present. I, I love that you, you, you talked about that, that term pressure. I, I had Clark Lee, the head coach of Vanderbilt on, and he was talking about his, his, his um, stint at, as been a D coordinator at Notre Dame. And legitimately, I mean, that's verbatim is what he said. It was like, it was so much pressure, but it was all it was all internal. It was all me putting the pressure yeah. on myself. And I feel like I feel like some of the people that do a really good job in this business actually do tend to put some pressure on themselves just to continue to make you know kind of push themselves to be better. Um, yeah. But at the same time, <laughs> man, that's stressful. And 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 you you could probably be just as productive when you take it off as you mentioned. So in that twenty year span, what what was that point that? I, I don't know how to frame this, but you just, you were in your groove, man. You're just the head coach of central and, and you just, not that you knew what you were doing. Cause I, you definitely give off the vibe that you're always going to be growing and always going to be, you know, right. asking questions and, and stuff. But you know, when, when, when were you comfortable? When were you ah, comfortable is a bad word. Uh, but you, you, you kind of get what I'm saying. When did you, I guess, put, yeah. take the pressures off yourself and, and, and yeah. just go do, do your thing. Yeah, I, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, we talk about this all the time, you know, when it comes to pressure, I mean, pressure can be a privilege. It, it yeah. can be a great, it can be a great motivator. Um, it can be, if you're in a pressure situation, you're obviously doing something really important. Yeah. Um, whether you think Very it's true. important or it is important or whatever, but, yeah. um, and what you can't do is you can't let it kind of break you down. And I Correct. think that you got to get to a point where, you know, you're, you're still really physically and mentally healthy and, and, yeah. uh, you know, you're, you're kind of accepting that pressure. And I think that, you know, probably in you know, the first three, four or five years as, as it kind of went through, I, I got a lot better at managing that. I think some yeah. of it was, you know, I, I took time uh, every day, you know, to spend some time in the word. Uh, and I, I took time to, to work out. I try and run in the morning or, or get a lift in yeah. uh, before my day gets started. And I think that that's been a really good thing. And I think just experience and then also opening yourself up to, to, you know, as a head coach, you know, trusting your staff, um, hi hiring good people and uh, kind of make sure you do a great job of communicating what you want and how you want it done. And then also letting go a little bit and let them, you know, trust them that they're going to do it. And I, I've, I've been really blessed here to have great assistant coaches. We have a great coaching staff right now. And um, I think that those have been things that have, 
I think over the years taking pressure off of me. I don't know that there was a one like year or one moment where I was like, you know what? Like I'm, I'm all good now. Like, yeah. I, I don't know that I'll ever be, right. you know, feel like it's, you know, all, all good and gravy and, you know, pressure free. But I think that, I, I think that uh, just being aware, you know, one of the things that I do too is I, I ask my staff for feedback on what I'm doing, how I'm doing. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll try and ask them every year, like, what's one thing that you like that I do uh, as a head coach and what's maybe what's one thing that I can improve on. And I try and take that information, both the good and, and the improvement uh, to heart. And I think that if you're always working to get better and, and you really are here to serve your team and serve your staff and serve your university uh, or college, I mean, I think that that's very valuable information. And if you keep focusing on those things and not focus on so much of the, the other stuff that's outside of what you can control, you know, our office line coach always says, control what you can control. And I think that there's a lot to that. You know, I think that when I got to that point where I could get back to just controlling what I could control, I, I, I took a lot of pressure off of myself and I worried a lot less. Yeah. Well, you, you know, you said something interesting there and, uh, I, just anytime I have the opportunity to have a head coach on, I, I think it's important to ask, especially with, with such a, a young, our young coaches really listen to this podcast a lot. And, uh, you know, um, you, you mentioned having, ha, you know, ha, trusting in your staff more, uh, you know, just kind of, kind of letting go a little bit of that, a little bit of that allow for you to kind of get into a, to a really good place as a head coach. Um, but that, you gotta make sure you got good people in it, right. <laughs> in order to kind of pass that trust. Right. And, uh, you know, as as you kind of said earlier in the podcast, you know, people take different jobs, right? And um, I'm sure you had to hire. Unfortunately, I'm sure you maybe had to fire a few guys here and there too. Uh, what what ha- what has kind of led? You know, what's been your philosophy in hiring coaches, I and mean, what is some what is something you're looking for? You know, what is something a young coach can listen to this part of the podcast and take away from that can help them be a better coach in regards to interviewing for jobs. I was actually just on a, a leadership panel um, uh, for a, a, a bank actually uh, last week, and someone at the bank, uh, someone someone on the panel had said this. And I thought there was a, a lot of truth to this. It's, it's hire slow and fire fast, you know. Like, um, and not that you know, I want to talk about firing people, and we've done very little of that here. Yeah. yeah um, but uh, um, I think that you know, go make sure you do your due diligence in the interview process and get to know, get to know what their value. First of all, find out what their values are and make sure your values and their values match up. Um, Because those values that that's the character of that person and all of your characters combined, that creates the culture of your, your program. And for you to have a strong, healthy program, you've got to have a strong, healthy culture. I'm a big, I really believe in that. I really do. And I've everywhere I've been, even when I was a player here, we understood, and I was back in the 80s, we understood the importance of how important our culture was. Yeah. And those are things that really haven't changed essentially. I think that's helped us win. Um, but, I, but I would tell you that your, your, your culture won't get right unless the people within your program have shared values. I mean, you don't all have to go to the same church or vote the same political party, uh, but you, there are certain components you've got to believe in, and those have to be shared things. And so we spend as much time – when we interview a coach, whether it be for a coordinator job or for a, or a position coach, um, we spend as much time or I spend as much time getting to know these, these coaches as men as I will, like what is their X and O knowledge? Yeah. Um, you know, we have a pretty good idea what we want to run here and then not that we won't ever evolve and change, but we, what we've done, it, it works well. It fits our players, fits our personnel. Um, so I don't necessarily need to hire somebody that invented football. Um, but I do need to hire somebody that's going to be a good fit in our staff and good, good with our players and good in our campus community. I think that those are really important things. If you get the character part right, the rest of the stuff I think has a way of kind of working well and kind of not necessarily taking care of itself, but, but that's, that to me is the critical part is, you know, get people, you know, get the right people on the bus and get them in the right seats. And, and you don't know if they're right or not unless you know what's on their heart and, you know, what they really value. Um, and if you can find people that have shared values, that gives you your best chance of success. It's interesting. Our, uh, we talk about hiring. Like I, I've had to hire an office coordinator this year and I'm hiring a defense coordinator right now. Um, our, our office coordinator uh, took a head coaching job and, and our defense coordinator, uh, uh, left to go with him. So we're in a situation now where we're, uh, we're going through these processes yeah. and, and we're talking about these things and we're living it out right now. So yeah. it's interesting that we're, we're on this subject. Well, Coach, I appreciate everything, man. This has been super enjoyable. Uh, 
uh, yeah, I want to brag on you real quick before before I let you go and ask you one last thing more about the AFCA. Um, on the bragging part, 155 and 48 overall record, six Division three playoff appearances, two time AFCA Division three Coach of the Year, 2021 AFCA Division three Coach of the Year. Um, has has not had a losing losing season since 1960. Um, I mean, you talk about <laughs> just carrying a legacy. Um, man, you know, you're doing a phenomenal job. Uh, we appreciate you being a representative of our of, of, of our organization and this great profession and uh, hit, hitting a little bit more on being a representative of our organization. Um, AFCA board member since 2014. Um, uh, involved, I remember, didn't know you from Adam, but I, I, I remember seeing you as a young coach, just all, always walking around the tie with the, I mean, in the suit and, suit and jacket with the, the badge on, and I remember being a young coach, being like, "Man, I want to be like those guys." And um, so awesome that I got the opportunity to end up here, um, and named the AFCA president in, in, at this 2024 convention. So, congratulations on that. Why has why is this part of the profession? I mean, that's you don't have to do this. Is I mean, I know you're going to be on a phone call tomorrow. It's going to eat up a lot of time, and you got all kinds of stuff going on in this profession right now. Uh, why? why 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 would you take some of that some time from you know, your program, your wife and your family, just to pour back into this great game. All right. So it kind of gets back to maybe this whole thing that we've talked about is in the AFCA for me was a chance to continue to grow as a coach and continue to learn. And I really would go to the convention every year and not only meet new coaches and network, but I really, I really would, I'd attend all the sessions and I'd, I'd take as many notes as I could. I'd come back every year with, you know, just so much information. And then as I got to doing that, um, I saw opportunities and, and, uh, had opportunities to, uh, get on committees and serve on committees. And, and Coach Skipper, who I played for at Central, was on the board of trustees back in the 90s when I was a young assistant coach in college and was also a former, uh, president. Uh, and, uh, so I kind of had a front row seat, kind of an example of what that looked like. And I mean, honestly, like, I, I, I didn't look at that and say, well, that's going to be me someday. I just, I honestly just want to keep learning and serving. Yeah. And then when I got on some committees and, and got to know, um, people through that and, and got, got to meet with a lot of really great coaches and learn a lot of things and hopefully help grow the game and improve the game. Um, I was fortunate enough to get on the division three head coaches council and started working with the division three head coaches. Uh, we have a, 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 a conference rep of every conference on our council and, um, I think the combination of that and then, you know, once again, serving on committees and just attending the convention every year um, gave me an opportunity to get voted into in the board of trustees and be a part of that. And, um, and it's, it's been great. I've, I've enjoyed every minute. I've learned so much uh, back in 1992 at my first convention uh, all the way up to now. I mean, when I go to board meetings, I, I learn a lot from the other coaches on the board and yeah. very appreciative of those relationships and the, and the information uh, that we discussed and the things that I'm able to learn about the different levels and just about our game and about our association. Uh, it's been a real honor and a real privilege. And, and I, I, I'm the lucky, lucky one. And I, I had a, I've been able to, to be a part of that and to really grow uh, myself as a person, as a coach. And, and, you know, you, uh, and I've also, I've also tried to bring my wife to the convention as many times as possible. And she's developed some great relationships through the AFWCA and also just in, other getting to know other coaches and other coaches' wives, and I I feel like that's been something that we've done together. You know, I I think that if I um if I could give anybody advice uh, in that realm of uh, your relationship with your your wife and your family, you know, like it's it's not uh, you, you're not really making a choice between your job and your career and your family. Uh, it's not an either or. It's really if you want to be fulfilled in it, you really have to blend it together and yeah. you have to find times where you can incorporate your wife and your children in what you do as a coach. And, and, um, you know, the times that my wife's family go to me to either a board meeting or to a convention, those have been, those have been really great experiences as well. It hasn't taken me away from learning or, or serving on any committees or anything, right. but it's just been, it's, I think she's, she's stayed connected to the game and to our association as well. And that's been a great thing for both of us. Coach, I appreciate you, man. Thanks so much for, you know, just just kind of talking about why it's been important for you, and and honestly, uh, including your spouse in that. Uh, once again, that that is important and a great opportunity to kind of get a kind of get a vacation out of it too, just to you know get away and bring bring the wife and, and kids. I always brought my wife with me as well. 
when I was My born. kids have never come, so I, oh, I will say that. Kids didn't come. They, I, I just brought the wife. Never, they've never been to the convention, <laughs> but, my, but my wife has. Wife right? has. I got you. I got you. Well, Coach, uh, we appreciate the time. Thanks so much for all that you do, number one, for us. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, we, 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 we strongly appreciate you. Super excited about you being the president. And then uh, what, what you've done for that program and what you've done, you know, just in this profession as, as a whole. I know you're making uh, life changing relationships. You probably said that word relationships about 10 times on a podcast. It's something that's important to you. We appreciate it. Thanks. I really appreciate this. Thanks for, like I say, including me in your podcast. It's, it's an honor to, to be a part of this and, and keep, keep up your good work. I mean, uh, I know this is a, it's a really important thing for the coaches and for our association that, uh, you know, people have the opportunity to learn and grow from other coaches and, and uh, you do a great job and your questions and, and how this all shakes out every time. Really well done. So good job to you. All right. Thanks, Coach. I appreciate you. And uh, I will see you soon. Okay. Okay. You bet. All righty. Thanks, Coach. Coachcom has been delivering tough headsets for tough teams for more than 31 years. It's why 97% of FBS teams in thousands of high schools across the country rely on Coachcom. Get the best for your team. Visit Coachcom.com for more info. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Inside the Headset, presented by Coachcom. If you'd like to learn more about this week's episode, head over to AFCA.com. There, you can access every episode and find corresponding show notes. Remember, you can catch every episode of Inside the Headset presented by Coach Com on wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. While you're there, we'd love for you to take a moment to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. Your feedback helps us improve and grow. Keep up with the latest news by following us on social media. Connect with us at Inside the Headset, and remember to tag us when you share your favorite episodes. For more updates on all things AFCA, be sure to follow the at We Are AFCA social media accounts. If you're not a part of the AFCA community yet, visit AFCA.com to join thousands of NFL, college, and high school coaches nationwide and across the globe. Elevate your coaching game with an AFCA membership. You'll gain exclusive access to the annual AFCA convention, magazine, digital library, and AFCA insider email. Stay up to date with the latest stories and news on the AFCA website. More than just a convention, the AFCA offers continuous education, guidance, networking, and more. Celebrate the past and shape the future with the AFCA. It's about fostering exceptional coaches who create outstanding teams and even better individuals. Invest in your skills and make a lasting impact today by engaging with the AFCA. Your journey starts here.